In this video, I'm gonna tell you how many cows per acre land in Texas will support. I'm also gonna cover some average carrying capacities and stocking rates around the state of Texas. On top of that, I'm gonna cover a few key factors that can impact the carrying capacity on your particular property to give you an idea where you may lie on some of these averages. And by the way, welcome to one of the most common and misunderstood topics about land in general. Welcome to Landowner TV, where I make you smarter about your land one video at a time. On this channel, I cover topics landowners frequently have questions about. Questions about livestock and conservation and wildlife and even hunting. Now I'm from Texas and most of my videos are on Texas style topics. Although if you're not from Texas, these concepts can most of the time be extrapolated to other parts of the country. So if you're a landowner or someone who likes to learn about land in general, be sure to subscribe to the channel so you can get smarter about your land too. Okay, so how many cows per acre can I have in Texas? Well, it's really about acres per cow. Because let's be honest, the only operations running multiple cows per acre are feedlots. And you're probably not interested in having your land look or smell like a feedlot. Nope. Uh, no thanks. Yeah, no thanks. And like I mentioned, this is one of the more commonly misunderstood topics about land. Many landowners often rely on the stocking rate advice of the guy leasing their property to run cattle. Or sometimes they'll get advice from their neighbors. And look, while there's something to be said about experience, I've personally seen this advice often lead to overgrazed pastures, which can look a lot more like parking lots than pastures. So before we step off too much, I do wanna cover two definitions for you. Number one, let's talk about carrying capacity. In this case, carrying capacity is the number of head of cattle that a given land area can sustain over time without degradation. So it's really about how much that land can support without being considered overgrazed. Now, stocking rate is a given number of animals over a given amount of land over time, like cows per acre per year. Carrying capacity across the state of Texas usually is reduced as you move from east to west. That's because Texas is a huge state. And as you move from east to west across the state, the average annual rainfall goes down. And that's indicated right here by this handy dandy picture. So you can see on the eastern part of the state, we have averages of over 35 inches a year. Whereas the western part, you may get as little as eight. Now carrying capacity can be as high as a cow per acre in East Texas, I'll explain, and as low as one cow per 150 acres in West Texas, especially in the Trans-Pecos region. Now the difference between an area to be able to sustain one cow per acre year over year versus one cow per 150 acres year over year really comes down to the land's ability to produce forage, because that's the limiting factor here. Of the three things something needs to survive, food, water, and shelter, we're gonna just cover food as a limiting factor. Although in West Texas, over large distances, water can be a limiting factor. For the most part, we're not gonna address that here in this video. So really what we're talking about is a land's ability to produce forage on an annual basis. So rain, soils, which species of forage, and the condition of those forages all play a role in how much forage is gonna be produced on an annual basis there. So we know it comes down to food production. What about the cattle? How much do they eat? The good news is we know a lot about how much a cow eats. In fact, researchers have developed a standard called an animal unit. And when we typically talk about carrying capacities or stocking rates, we're typically gonna to refer to how many animal units that land can sustain per month, per year, or per acre. And just so you know, an animal unit is a thousand pound mama cow that eats about 2.6% of her body weight a day. So that's 26 pounds a day. You move that out, that's around 9,500 pounds a year. And by the way, that's 9,500 pounds of dry matter forage. So we're not talking about the weight of lawn clippings. We're talking about grass that's been cut and then dried in an oven and then still weighs 26 pounds in a day. So that's how much we're talking here. Okay, to bring that back, we know how much they eat. There's a lot of good data on how much forage is produced. So you might think that because land produces 9,500 pounds an acre, that, and that's how much an animal unit eats a year, that it could sustain one animal unit a year. In fact, that's not the case because you really wouldn't want to use 100% of what's produced. A general rule is to take half and leave half. In other words, you're going to take half the production that those plants produce a year, and you're going to leave the other half to allow that plant to use those leaves to store carbohydrates and grow. Okay, so let's answer the question directly now. Check out this chart that I put together. This chart, as you can see, shows you the average carrying capacities for different ecoregions of the state of Texas. I'll flip the chart back in a second, but I want you to understand here are the ecoregions of the state of Texas. You have the East Texas Piney Woods, the Edwards Plateau, Post Oak Savannah, South Texas Plains, and so on and so forth. 
Okay, back to the chart, because I know that's probably why you clicked on the video. So as you would expect, East Texas generally has the highest carrying capacities in the state, and therefore allows the highest stocking rates in the state. And once again, as you move west and south, those carrying capacities are reduced. And once again, this has a lot to do with rainfall. But you'll also notice that I made three handy columns that indicate the different kind of pastures that you might see on your land. Improved, or let's say managed pasture, because in general, I'm not sure if they are improved grasses, rather they're more introduced. More on that in a second. We have native pasture, and then we have woodland areas. Improved or managed pasture are mostly introduced grasses. Unlike many of the native grasses, most of the introduced grasses respond vigorously to fertilizer. And that's one of the big reasons you see increased carrying capacities for the improved pastures. Because I'm assuming that those are gonna be managed pastures, they're gonna be fertilized, they're gonna be rotationally grazed, etc. Now some introduced grasses, like the seeded Bermudas and the hybrid Bermudas, can show an increase in yield of over 100% if fertilized and managed well. That's double by simple fertilization. And to get to the highest stocking rates possible, especially with managed pasture, most livestock managers will utilize a rotational grazing system where they heavily graze part of the year and then they let it rest for part of the year. It allows those grasses time to recover, produce more, and then they come back with the cattle and knock them down again. And that happens year over year. Now, as you probably guessed, the native pastures in this column are mostly represented by native grass species. Although I'll say a couple of introduced varieties like King Ranch Blue Stem, although introduced, responds a lot like a native grass. And as you move from east to west, what we define as a native grass pasture changes from a composition perspective. In East Texas, you might have more big blue stem, little blue stem, switchgrass, Indian grass. And as you move towards the hill country, you'll get more silver blue stem and side oats grama. And as you move further west, you'll get more grama species. And in general, like I mentioned, those species are producing less and less on an annual basis. And the big difference is that native grass pastures really don't respond to fertilization. But one big benefit that native grass pastures do have is they have way more to offer from a wildlife perspective. Large monoculture introduced grass pastures are really deserts for wildlife versus a large native grass pasture will have a variety of species and will probably have a better mix of annual and perennial forbs which are all heavily utilized by wildlife. If you're wanting to produce things like wildlife and not just cattle, native pastures might be a way to go. But clearly, if you're focused on production only, many times it's gonna be those introduced pastures that are heavily managed. Now, woodlands, as you might expect, their area is dominated by trees and, and tall brush. So in South Texas, you'll have the mesquite and wesatch. You'll have the pine trees of East Texas. You can have your cattle graze in each of these areas. But as you can imagine, there's typically less available sunlight hitting the forest floor producing those forages for the cattle. Now one thing you're probably noticing on the chart right there is that each section varies pretty wildly and there's a range for the carrying capacity for every section. And that's very intentional. You might be saying, hey Michael, you're telling me that if I have 100 acres in East Texas that I might be able to have 33 to 100 head of cattle on that 100 acres? I'm gonna say, yeah, but it's probably way closer to 33 since you're asking me the question. The fact is running closer to one cow per acre is something that is done really by the pros who have done this for a long, long time. Not to say that you can't get there really quick, but you'd have to understand the rotational grazing factor and get in the cadence of multiple fertilizations a year because it does depend on what's actually out on your land, which is why I was a bit hesitant at first about putting a table together at all. Has your property been overgrazed for years? Do you have a rotational program? Do you have adequate water distribution? How often do you fertilize? And by the way, what grass species is in your pasture? That all makes a big difference. Now I am going to make a whole other video that will walk you through calculating exactly how many cows you can have on your property. So if that's something you're interested in, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. If you want more information about what I just talked about, head over to landassociation.org. I have a complete article on this very topic that'll help answer a lot of your questions. Plus the chart and all the images that I use, they're on that article. And there's a bunch of references like forage production guides put out by the AgriLife Extension and things like that that will help you get a more specific answer to your question. I really hope you enjoyed the video. I enjoyed making the video. Once again, this is my favorite thing to talk about and I look forward to seeing you on the next one. Thanks.